Good evening. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Uh, so glad, so honored to have you here with us today. Uh, certainly, it's a blessing. God is doing great things, and God is blessing us right now. And uh, we're in some very critical times, but in spite of what we're going through, I want you to know God is still good. And uh, we are resilient, and we are resilient people. And uh, although this may be new to us, it's certainly not new to God. And God is not intimidated by pestilence. God is not intimidated by plague. God is not intimidated with unstable leaders. God is not intimidated by wicked and selfish agendas. We still serve a God of righteousness, a God of truth, a God of grace, a God of mercy. And certainly we are honored that God has met us today with new mercies. And I honor God for his mercies every day. And certainly in these times, it's very, very easy to focus on the things that are difficult and the things that we don't like and the things that are bad. It's so easy for us to get distracted by what's not going well. And uh, so easy to focus and develop a woe is me mentality because certainly, without a doubt, these are difficult times. I would be dishonest and uh, wouldn't be fair if I tried to act as if what's happening now is not happening. This is a tough time in which we live in. Uh, we've never quite seen anything like this in our lifetimes. It's affected every segment of society and that's true that's 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 the facts and i want to be honest with you and so faith is not a negation or a denial of the facts uh, faith is the acceptance of the fact yeah there is a pandemic it's not a hoax it's not something that's been fabricated by the media people are dying we're living in a time of global pandemic and it's affecting houses of worship it's affecting wall street uh, our house your house main street everybody we're affected by it uh, and so we have to find a way, how do we get through it and how do we still believe that God is still in control? And I believe that. I, I know God is still in control and I know God's going to watch over us and I know God's going to see us through it. And I hope you have that same determination, a dogged determination that we're going to see it through, that we're going to get through this. And, and somehow, some way, when we get through it, there will be some lessons learned. And for many of us who can endure this, we'll be stronger and wiser on the other side. And so I'm not trying to be a pessimistic preacher, nor am I trying to be an optimistic orator, just trying to speak faith to you to let you know that every storm does have an expiration date and we will get through this. I want to thank you for your support of our church online. And we've been doing some things with what we call Hope TV, uh, just trying to bring our ministry online, trying to minister to the whole segment, really of our own congregations, five generational church. But by means of doing that, we also want to minister to those who are interested in our ministry. So thank you for all you've done. I want to thank our team, my staff, uh, for the Herculean job that they have done in trying to just minister to you in a way that we've never done before. Uh, we seems like, seems like we've been prepared for this moment in terms of media, and God knows what God is doing. And so I hope you've been blessed. If you have, by any of our programming, let us know. Drop us a line. Let us know where you're watching from, and uh, let us know how you've been blessed. And certainly, not only that, but if you can like this, uh, on the platform that you're watching, you can subscribe to our YouTube channels and follow us on Facebook. And if you're not, uh, if you're blessed by it, why don't you consider sharing the link with somebody else uh, who you think may be blessed by it? I certainly would appreciate that. You know, I am a preacher, a third generational Baptist preacher on my paternal side, preaches all of my family on my maternal side. So, church has been a part of my life, um, all I know. I grew up in it, I love the church. And in spite of we living in an anti-faith, anti-church climate, I still love the church. And I believe that the church is the key and the foundation. I believe Christ has come back with the church. And, and while different ethnic persuasions are watching, races are watching, I still believe, you know, in the African-American tradition of the church. I still believe in, in the black church, for, for lack of a better phrase. I still believe in it. I believe it's been the institution that we've owned. I believe it's been an institution that's been a source of power, of education. You study the history of it. Many of the gains that we've made in terms of African Americans, those who are watching now who are African Americans, you know that it has some a connection and some correlation with the church. And I still thank God for the church. And I do believe that our faith and our church and churches will help usher people and move people through this season. And so it's time for the church to rise to the forefront, to be there for the people. And I believe we're going to continue to show that resilience. But in a real sense, we're challenging these times because uh, in my 30 years of pastoring, this is my first time seeing uh, that the church is challenged not just to bless people, but this is the first time where I've seen how churches will be challenged. 
I was joking with some buddies last night, my college roommates who are both preachers, and we talked about how the church typically is about, uh, about mission and benevolence, and the job of the church is to look out for the orphans and widows and the least, the last, and the lost, and we chuckled and uh, in our musings last night. And in a real sense, we kind of, it's humorous, and uh, I don't want to uh, mess this moment up with comedy, but in a real sense, while the churches has been a vehicle, churches have been a vehicle uh, for restoration and benevolence, but in this present day and time, uh, churches and pastors are gonna have cups on the corner. Uh, we'll work for food. Uh, can you drop something in our bucket? Because we've been uh, ushers and vehicles of benevolence, but right now churches are gonna need benevolence. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting time. And you're gonna see some pastors and deacons on the corner washing cars at the window, selling water at the cooler. Can y'all see it? Yeah, it's gonna be a time now. You're gonna see mothers frying fish again or something because we something has to happen because uh, this thing has really affected us and some churches were already affected by it before this season and now this has only exacerbated it. So it's in a real sense, y'all, we really gotta have some conversations about churches and about people. And so sometimes it's hard for the church to help people if the church is not liberated. And that is uh, a man of God who I've followed this ministry for a long time, a native of Brooklyn, New York, a graduate of Fordham University, um, graduate of Princeton University, uh, BA from Fordham and his uh, master's from Princeton University and his doctor of ministry from uh, the United Theological Seminary in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, he is, uh, he's been a pastor for 30 years at the First Baptist of Lincoln Garden there in Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, actually getting ready to retire this year and after three decades of uh, peerless service there at First Baptist. Uh, he's been engaged not just from a ecclesiastical perspective, but he's also been civically and politically engaged. Uh, he was the former Secretary of State for the state of New Jersey. He served on several economic commissions, federal commissions. Uh, he's been involved in philanthropic endeavors. He's been involved in community services and human resources and uh, just a tremendous vessel of God. I became familiar with this ministry through a program he started to help African-American uh, congregations and the membership uh, to eliminate debt, a program called DeFree. And I began to investigate it along with some members of our church several years ago, and we adopted it and implemented those strategies, and it's been transformative uh, to many members of our church. And I think right now, not only do members of our church need to be individual, but I think these principles also can be applied uh, for congregations, for pastors, uh, as the kids would say, for Lottie, Dottie, and everybody, uh, because we know that the bar is still a slave to the lender. And so I am... It is with great joy and great humility and a great esteem and honor, uh, brothers and sisters, that I present to us today our, our, our host, or well, the person I'm going to be I'm going to be hosting tonight, our guest. Uh, he's going to share with us, and uh, you can have questions, submit them. But he's the pastor, First Baptist there in Lincoln Garden, there in Somerset, New Jersey. I speak of none other than the le the legend, Dr. DeForest B. Soares Jr. Dr. Soares, how are you, sir? <laughs> I am uh, I'm speechless. You you have a gift, and if you ever decide to leave the pulpit, there's a stage somewhere in a comedy club <laughs> waiting waiting for you. But I, first of all, well, you know, you know, all this esteem makes it seem like I'm so much older than you. You know, I'm, I'm older than you, but, but I'm not I'm not old enough to, for to, for all of that. But listen, Dr. Smith, thank you so much. Listen, you're doing such a great work. You do such great ministry. You are tireless. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how you do all that you do, but you do it well. And that's what I love about you Great and your God. team. Excellence is really the trademark of your ministry, and I appreciate you having me tonight. Wow. Wow. Uh, you, you, you are uh, with indeed um, a general, I believe, uh, and not just in the kingdom of God and by the Christ. Uh, however you want to call it, but I just believe as a leader, you are just an incredible leader. And I don't Thank say what I don't mean, and I have the utmost respect for you as a man and as a leader, as a thinker. And it's I'm serious. It's, I'm honored that you're here because I know that you can help us. And, you know, you got to forgive me for my uh, temporary lapses of comedy. My mom dropped me on my head when I was three months, and I haven't been, I haven't been the same since. So every no, now and then I it comes and it goes. Life. So just stick with me. Um you know, you, you've been pastoring, you've been leading, you've been involved in state government, you've been involved in pastoring leadership, empowering people, social justice, you've been, a, you've been an advocate for, on so many levels. 
Uh, I just want to get what is your um, what is your contention? What is your position on the climate in which we're living now in terms of finances, the coronavirus? What do you see? What are you sensing? We're going to get into some nuts and bolts, but I want to just get an overall view. What are you sensing right now? What are you feeling? Well, first, you said it best when you described us in uncharted waters. We have never seen this kind of dilemma before in our lives. When we were in slavery, we were in slavery by ourselves. The whole world wasn't in slavery. Mm. You know, we were in slavery. And we had 400 years of trying to climb out of slavery on our own. The Catholic Church didn't help us. There were no United Nations. You know, we were, we were slaves in isolation. When the Hutus and the Tutsis were at war in, in uh, Africa, that they were they were isolated. When when Tiananmen Square saw Chinese young people rising up and then being suppressed by the government, that was an isolated situation. We have never had a global pandemic to the extent that we have it now, and everybody has the same problem. Now, when I say we, mm. in 1918, there was a global pandemic. There was a, a Spanish flu, 50 million people died. But in 1918, mm -hmm. there was no internet. There was, there was no pharmaceutical industry. In 1918, we had not placed a man on the moon. And so what, what, what I see is this contrast. On the one hand, as Charles Dickens said, these are the best of times. I mean, we, we have every tool that we need to be superior to every other generation in history. On the other hand, we have such fair leadership that 60 years ago, we put a man on the moon and now we can't get masks and ventilators to hospitals. So it's, it's a sad situation. It's unprecedented. And it's a time when we need leadership more than ever before. And we have less leadership than, than we need. Lord have mercy. That, that is so rich and so true. And uh, I mean, and we talk about faith all the time. But at the end of the day, there's some things that only, will only happen as a result of leadership. You know, you you developed Deep Free some years ago, and when I became familiar with you, I, I think you were, if I'm not mistaken, at the time, I think you were trying to eliminate within your congregation $1 million worth of debt within one year, if I'm not mistaken. Can you just kind well, of bring we were, people? A lot of people have heard yeah. about it, but I don't want to take for granted that everybody is familiar with the Deep Free program and their churches, their pastors, uh, tens of thousands who are actually going to see this. And I just know that we need tools that are unique to us, uh, developed by us, because while certain stewardship principles may be applicable, it's wonderful in this context that this was done within the confines and with the parameters of an African-American experience for those African-Americans. So can you just talk about what gave birth to D-Free and, uh, and what has happened from its infancy to where you are now? After being at First Baptist for 15 years, I, like you, had a mortgage on the church and I, like you, had expanded ministry beyond the four walls of the church, and the church was in debt. And when you have a large facility, you know this, some people come to the building just because it's a big building, and, and you, you have good worship, you have good music, and what we found by the mid-2005 by, by the mid was that people were coming to the building, they liked the music, they liked the food, they liked everything, but they weren't giving money. And my trustee hmm. called a meeting with me one day and said, Reverend, you know, people come to hear you preach, they're singing, they're waving flags, they're shouting, but they're not giving money. And, you know, when our grandparents were coming up, the church was all we had and the church was our priority. But church became more like entertainment and giving became optional. And so we had, we had a tough time. Right, right after we built our new facility, we spent $23 million. We bought 13 houses, relocated families. You know, it was an expense. And I'm in New Jersey. I'm not in Atlanta. And, and so I was ready to quit then, 15 years ago. I had written out my resignation. But then, I, but then the Lord really spoke to me. And, and, and I had a real spiritual experience in the, in the parking lot of my church when the cars that were parked there driven by my members started talking to me and they all had accents. They had German accents, British accents, one had an Italian accent. And I realized that my members were driving all these fancy cars, but they were living paycheck to paycheck. They had nothing saved. They were, they were, their identity was wrapped up in their possessions. 
And I recognize it because when I was working for Jesse Jackson back in the 70s as a civil rights activist, I fell into the same trap. And so I told my, my leadership at the church that I was going to help our members get out of debt. And if we did that, the members would help the church get out of debt. So we started, we, we started with Proverbs 22, seven, the borrower was slave to the lender. We took a civil rights type activist approach to addressing financial freedom. We took the words of Dr. King. Dr. King said, it does not matter if you have the right to eat at a lunch counter and can't afford a hamburger. So we, we started really focusing on financial freedom from a biblical and cultural perspective. We didn't beat anybody up, but started analyzing the culture, started really looking at the fact that consumerism had become as vicious as racism. We started mm -hmm. dealing with the scriptures. Luke 15 is not just about a prodigal son that left his moral bearings, but it's about a young man that was impatient, impetuous, and imprudent, and went broke. So, mm. so we put together this strategy, and it's kind of, it's a brand we call it D Free because we found that our folk would rather say I'm trying to be D Free than I'm drowning in debt. So it's a brand, it's a curriculum. We've got a 12 step process. You know this. Many of your members have gone through the process, and it's a movement. It's people organizing people to do what our grandparents did naturally. Our grandparents didn't have credit cards. They didn't have payday loans. My grandmother had four dresses. She had eight children. She had two dresses for church, one for first Sunday, one for the other Sundays, two dresses for work. She worked for rich white people, cleaned their uh, clothes, cooked their food, raised their kids. And she owned her own house, always had money. So we, we, I took black culture and our history the way Madam C.J. Walker did it, the way uh, Frederick Douglass did it, and, and just packaged it so that our generation could go back to who we used to be. You went, did, did you go to Bishop College? Went to Morehouse. You went to Morehouse. Morehouse yes, College. Sir. If we had to start a Morehouse College today, we couldn't do it. Now, of course, we had help from white people, but they didn't do it for us, they did it with us. And um, in one year, and one year at First Baptist, every Sunday school class, every Bible study, every Sunday morning sermon, every revival service focused on a biblical principle around money. And we challenged from a spiritual perspective, the way we make priorities. You know, the Bible says God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. But if we've never identified our needs versus our wants, We'll be praying for what we want, mad at God because we didn't we didn't get it. But in fact, God's already given us what we need. So it's oh a God. theological, spiritual, cultural strategy based on measurable outcomes. I decided um, there, there were two things bothering me, Dr. Smith. On the one hand, the prosperity preachers were driving me crazy. You know, when I was coming along, there was a guy named Reverend Ike. Re Reverend Ike's message was you know bring me the money honey you can't lose with the stuff i use had slick hair rolls royces <laughs> custom suits <laughs> they asked they asked me one night one time uh you know adam powell's in new york he's passing legislation to help poor people dr king's in atlanta he's marching to help poor people I said Reverend Ike, what are you doing to help poor people i said what i'm doing to help poor people is reducing their number by one <laughs> He said, I'm helping poor people by not being one of them. <laughs> so when I was coming along, if somebody called you a Reverend Ike, that was an insult. That, that was an absolute insult. It, it meant that you were a con artist. It meant that you were a spiritual pervert. Today, I've lived long enough to see some cats on TV, unlike you and your ministry. They make Reverend Ike look like Dr. King. And I was, I was oh, so angry at the pimps in the pulpit that were telling people, look, if you make the preacher rich, God will make you rich. Mm. That, that I had to do something about that. Then on the other hand, oh I was God. also, I, I was upset because systemic racism was planting high interest check cashing facilities and payday loan stores in our neighborhoods. I went to yes, a sir. neighborhood in, in, in Missouri that had no supermarket, but had five payday loan stores charging five, 600% interest. Systemic racism had been so pervasive 
that we were still the last high of the first five. We had no strategy. And so I decided that we needed a strategy. We have a strategy for protest. We have a strategy for politics. We need a strategy for financial freedom. And that's what the free did. We started our church five years in CNN did a documentary on our ministry. 15 million people saw it. And I've been answering the call ever since from churches wanting to help set financial captives free. Yeah. That's absolutely amazing. And, uh, you know, we have been utilizing the program for several years now yeah. uh, on Sundays and also in our small groups. And uh, we have uh, our lead uh, financial deep free person, Sabrina Portris, who is now working with our church's stewardship and budget committee. Uh, she's helping people individually, of course, to work out of their debt through D free. But now she's also working with our stewardship and budget committee of our church, trying to help the church do the same. Uh, let me ask yeah. you a question. Um, based upon where we are now in the climate, in terms of um, the membership, in terms of what's happening, in terms of the economy presently, what do you anticipate the strategy of churches? What should our strategy be going forth? Should we still take the people first approach in terms of making sure the people are good and then hoping that they, is it a good time once everything, once we get back to public gatherings? Yeah. Appropriate time you yeah, think will well, be to implement D free principles. As you know, not only is this uh, coronavirus a health issue, it has really turned the world global economy on its head. And I do think that we have to, uh, in our churches, execute strategy that meets the needs of the people first, because if we don't meet the needs of the people, we're not a church. You can be a church without a building, but you can't be a church without people. And what we've said Doc, at home is that the church is open, the building is closed, but the church is open. Yeah. And we've got to make sure. What, what, one, of the, one of the positive outcomes, you know, James says, count it all joy, you know, when, when you run into trouble, you're not happy because you're in trouble, but you have joy in spite of your trouble. And there are things to be grateful for, as you said in your open. We recruited, for instance, 250 volunteers from our church. I don't know when the last time was I got 250 people signed up in two days for ministry. And their task is to call a senior citizen at least twice a week, because now that we're homebound, folk could die in their apartments who live alone. You don't know it until the crisis is over. So now we, we've unleashed ministry in the lives of people who, many of whom were just coming to church. And there's nothing wrong with just going to church. But sometimes I believe God has to shut something down to open something up. And now that the My church goodness. is shut, there are a lot of lives that are open to doing ministry who are only coming to church being an audience instead of a worshiping congregation. So in that sense, yes, I think we have to put the needs of the people first. And that includes helping people understand that if you lose your job, this new legislation promises to give you unemployment checks at the level of your previous employment. If you own a small business, this new legislation gives you access to low interest loans and grants. If you run a church and you have a payroll, this new stimulus package that was signed by the president, this stimulus package gives churches the right to be treated like small businesses. And we are small businesses where we can get funds to pay our payroll that start out as loans and then they're forgiven. So you, you know this on Wednesday, I'm having a weapon off for pastors and church leaders to make sure we know how to put the people first, but in so doing, protect the church from further disaster because if we don't gather, we don't give. You know, I was at a Jewish congregation one Friday night and the service was over, my choir sang, I preached, and the rabbi was giving the benediction. I stopped him, I said, man, you, Wait a minute, you forgot something. He said, well, what's wrong with you? I said, you didn't take up an offering. He said, oh, we, we, don't do, we, we don't take up offerings and doing worship. And I said, well, how do you get the money? He said, they just mail it in every month. People make a commitment. They mail in a check every month. We never take up an offering, he said, during worship. I said, son, if we didn't take up an offering during worship, we, we wouldn't last three months. And now here we are incapable of gathering in the church and 
for some of us, like these progressive churches in Atlanta, like 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 House of Hope, you know, you've been doing online ministry, you've been doing broadcast, you've been doing on, uh, electronic giving for years, but some of our churches don't even have websites. Some of our churches don't use social media. And so it's incumbent, I believe, upon us, those of us that God has blessed to have capacity, to have experience. I've been streaming for 21 years. That, that it's up to us to teach the smaller churches because the Bible says to whom much is given, much is required. That's so our members, is, our, is our, members so... Are facing, our members are facing economic uh, challenges. So are the churches and, and what, what you and I are committed to doing is serving the churches to help them serve their members. So do you think, is there any way for people to do D-Free online? Should we wait till we gather back? Oh, yeah. I highly recommend it. And of course, your your, your workshop on, on um, uh, this coming Wednesday, we're sure, certainly sure going to push that because I'm all about trying to yeah. empower it because, you know, I just think, you know, we, when we've spoken earlier, but I, I, I just, I, I don't think there's so much selfishness, in, particularly down here in Atlanta, you know, I, I, there's such, such a sense of territorialism and everybody's in their own corner doing their own thing. And so being collaborative is something that we just don't see. I didn't grow up seeing that. I grew up seeing preachers at the associations and the conventions and Fifth Sunday district meetings, and they had a little more collaborative spirit. Unfortunately, some of those things just lost their relevance, but a sense of connectedness took place. And, uh, and what I'm seeing now particularly here is a lot of fragmentation. And so what I try to do is just share what I know. When I start pastoring, uh, July, uh, in July 1990, I had my first revival. And I couldn't get a preacher to come preach for me because I had, we didn't have a 20 people. And so going on that list and preachers and, and people asking what we could pay them, we only had $300 in the bank. And so I, right. I, I promised the Lord, if you ever bless me, that I right. will never forget uh, these days. And if somebody else needed help, if I could help them, I would do it. And, uh, and I know that's your spirit. See? And uh, so I, I want to make sure any information we have, we put it out there. But I'm yeah, just trying to figure why, out that's as you said. You. That's why I love you. Wow. Uh, you know um, that our website is mydfree.org. My m y d f r e e dot org. Right there, it's on the screen. And yes, you can go through the whole D Free course online for free. You go to that website. You sign up under the D Free Academy. Now, what 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 do we mean by the course? What is what is this? The first thing that we have to understand about money is that learning how to handle money has nothing to do with money. You really don't manage mm. money. What you do is you manage your life and then you use mm. money to help reach your life goals. You can't manage money. Mm. It's about mm. life management. And so we start out in D3 helping people understand what drives us to spend money the way we spend it. I had to confess as a preacher, that I was addicted to neckties, addicted. I'd go to the store to buy socks and come home with three new neckties. I have neckties in the, in the bedroom. I got neckties in the bathroom. I got neckties at the church. And I had to break that spirit of addiction for neckties because the money I was spending on neckties, I could have been given to the scholarship fund. I was a pastor of the church, addicted to neckties. And we got hmm. folk addicted to Starbucks. We've got folk addicted to Netflix. And, and the point is not so much to uh, pray that God will give us more money until we promise God to take control of the money that we have. So, so but let's talk about the coronavirus, because right now, there, the, most of us don't have $400 to handle an emergency. Mm -hmm. And what I want is for during this season, I want us to learn how to not only survive in this season, but to ensure that the next time we have a downturn, we've got some emergency funds. We've, we've got some uh, cushion so that if our job goes under, we don't go under with it. Uh, we want our people to stop using GoFundMe as an insurance policy. GoFundMe is not an insurance <laughs> company. Go, GoFundMe is a platform for raising money. So, so uh, D3 basically says this, four things. One, Here's how you get started. You could be debt broke. You could be drowning in debt. You could be unemployed. Here's how you get started. You write down every penny you spend. You look for spending leaks. 
you make some decisions. Do I really need 800 TV stations? Or can I buy a fire stick and watch all the stations I need for free? So, so that's where you, and then the second is to uh, get control. We have literally lost control of our own resources. That's why the NAACP must have white people giving it money because if it didn't, it would go under. Most hmm. of our black colleges are barely surviving because black college graduates and black churches don't give money to black colleges. Even the Deltas and the AKAs have trouble getting their own members to pay their dues. Hmm. But Neiman Marcus, Nordstrom's, My God. Uh, Ashley Stork, they have no problem getting us. We, we fought for weeks over Popeyes versus Chick-fil-A. <laughs> and we don't own either. <laughs> so my God. So so we talk about get started, get control, then get ahead. How is it that people without any education who can't speak our language can come here from any country in the world and buy up our neighborhood in one year? Hmm. Because there, it's a mentality. So this coronavirus gives us a chance to do three things. Number one, to, to really, we have extra time now because we don't, we can't ride all over the place and go out at two o'clock in the morning and, and dance until six. So we have time to really focus on a strategy for our future. Second thing we have the opportunity to do is, is mandatory to figure out what we're doing with our money. Now we're, we're saving money, believe it or not, without saving, we're saving. You can't go to the club because it's closed. You can't go eat out uh, two and three nights a week because the restaurants are closed. We, we can't do the things we normally do that kind of pull our money away. So now we, every week during coronavirus, when things are shut down, we should look at how much we're saving. We don't need gas because there's no way to drive. We can't go shopping because the malls are closed. And by the time this coronavirus season is over, we should have collected and save money for the first time, some of us in our lives. And the third thing we wanna do is to really make some concrete commitments and plans to do something different with our money. So, so uh, Doc, I, I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about having joy because I've got people calling me now who heard me. I, I, I called me yesterday. He said, I bought your book five years ago when I'm just starting to read it. Wow. Yeah, hmm. but we can do this. You like know, you said, I'm, we've, been through, we've been through tougher times than this. We've been through, uh, black folk have been through hell and high water. And, and what the world needs to know is that if, if God could bring black folk through the middle passage, slavery, Jim Crow, Reagan, Nixon, and Trump, God, God can take anybody through anything. That's a, that's, that's, that, that is an absolute truth. You know, when you talked about the stimulus packages earlier for churches, yeah. um, my question is, and I know some of these things perhaps maybe in your call on Wednesday, but do you have any advice for churches that are dealing with the banks now? Um, yeah. And I don't want, of course, I know you deal with this on Wednesday. And we're going to encourage everybody no, to go no, no. make sure they log everybody on. What, what kind of, uh, can you give me a synopsis on what that conversation should look like? Yeah, and I'll tell you what, what, what I'm doing. Um, first of all, every bank in America is now in a position to help everybody in ways that it was not before. And I'll explain that in a minute. But if you have a loan with a bank, the first thing you want to do is contact the bank, whether it's your house loan or your church loan. Contact the bank and say, I want for the next three months, I don't want to make any payments, at least three months. I would ask for six because we don't know how long this is going to last. You got to call the bank and say, right now, you, you, you know what's happening. This is not a secret. What we want is a six month agreement. Some, some banks call it deferral. Some banks call it forbearance. We don't want to pay a penalty. We don't want to pay a fee. What you do is you take those three to six months and instead of paying them now, you put them on the back of the loan so that whatever date your loan was supposed to be paid off, it's now six months long. Even if you have the money, I, I have the money to pay my mortgage, but there's nothing wrong with letting the bank wait and keeping that money because cash is king during crisis. 
So you want as much cash as possible. You should get the name of the person that you talk to because what you don't want is to talk to somebody today and then you wait a week, nothing happens, you call back and the person you talk to doesn't know what you're talking about. Get it in writing as quickly as you can and make sure there are no penalties attached to what you've agreed to. Now, Doc, here, here is something that people need to really understand. Pastors, trustees, church leaders. When we borrow money from banks, we, we don't simply agree to pay a certain amount of money per month. We also agree to have, for instance, a certain amount of money in the bank account. We agree to have a certain amount of money left over every month after we pay all our bills. These are called covenants. And every loan agreement has covenants. And you can make your payments on time every single month, but still be in default of your covenants. And the regulators, the government agencies that check the books of the banks, they will penalize the bank if the bank allows a borrower to continuously violate the covenants. Many churches during the uh, financial crisis would call me and say, Reverend, I make my mortgage payment every single month and now the bank is foreclosing on my property. And it's because they didn't have the covenants in their minds. They didn't have the ratios. And so when we negotiate these three months, we have to make sure we also renegotiate our covenants because after the crisis is over, even with cash in the bank, we're still not going to have as much money coming in on Sunday as we used to have coming in. In fact, some of us may never go back to the levels we were at one day, which means that we've got to renegotiate not just the loan payment, but we have to renegotiate the covenants. A fellow called me Friday and he said, Reverend, I took out a loan from the bank and, and the loan included a requirement that I have $60,000 in an account in that bank. Now, if I can't make the loan payment, I want to take part of that 60000 and make the payment. And the bank said, no, you can't touch that money because you agreed to keep $60,000 in this account. So these are the kinds of considerations that I want pastors and church leaders to understand. And I'm assembling a team of people that will help churches if they don't have people in their congregation that understand this kind of finance uh, issue to, to ensure that churches don't go down simply for a lack of knowledge. That's, that's absolutely uh, golden information. And thank you for sharing that yeah. uh, because I think a lot of people are just lost. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, and, you know we, even though there are a lot of different people from all over the world watching this, you know, when I talk to a lot of our, our African-American counterparts, uh, those who went to seminary may take a church, church administration course here or there, but when it comes to money and management in a real yeah. sense and managing through a crisis and leadership and financial planning and budgeting, you know, a lot of our, you know, theological institutions and seminaries didn't really prepare us to lead and to manage. And so the things that you're sharing, Hercule, what brought you, what, so, so, so your evolution in this came out of the experience you talked about with your church uh, 15 years ago? Yeah, but even prior to that, on a personal note, uh, Pastor Smith, I, I decided that I could not spend the rest of my life just being mad for being broke and being mad at white people for slavery. I decided that mad is not a strategy. <laughs> you know, you get mad and you give a speech and you cuss folk out and you feel better and you go home and you're still broke. I, I, I just decided that I had... To your point, I had to learn things I didn't learn in, in Princeton. You know, I took counseling, I took preaching, I took Old Testament, I took New Testament, I took theology, I took all these courses. And then when I got to First Baptist, I had to do a budget and cash flow projections. I had to negotiate loans with banks and deal with banking covenants. So I decided that if I had to deal with money, the best place to start learning was not in school, but at the bank. So there was a little bank around the corner from the church and I opened an account at the bank and I got on the board of the bank and I served on the loan committee, the investment committee. I started learning about banking by sitting on the board of a bank. I now sit on the board of the Federal Home Loan Bank in New York and our bank lends money to banks. 
So, so I decided that if, if, listen, we have our civil rights, we had our voting rights, we, you know, we, we, we're black and proud. We, we got all of what our grandparents prayed we would have, but what we lacked was a financial strategy, a financial plan and financial capacity. And so I decided to commit my, the rest of my adult life to working on what we don't have. You know, I've got, I've got friends, you got some too, but I, I've got friends who, who were part of that preacher psyche trying to be the next Martin Luther King Jr. And there's no such thing as the next Martin Luther King Jr. And, and that model of leadership, by the way, is based on the Moses model. You know, Moses goes to the mountain, talks to God, comes down, leads the people out of the promised land. But you got to read the end of the story. Moses died and never made it to the promised land. So I started looking at Nehemiah and the Nehemiah model leadership. It may not be as charismatic as Moses, but Nehemiah had a passion and a burden for the people. First thing he did was pray. Second thing he did was go to the king and get some resources. And when he got to Jerusalem, he convinced the people to build the wall. He lived to see the wall built. He lived to dedicate the wall. He lived to celebrate the wall. And his epitaph said, and the people had a mind to work. That for me My was God. a new model for leadership. And I decided I did not want to be Moses. I wanted to be Nehemiah. Oh, have mercy. That is so good. That, that is absolutely incredible. What a paradigm. What a picture. Uh, thanks for sharing. Let me ask you this question. I had a conversation with a couple of guys yesterday about you know, staff layoffs, et cetera. Yeah. One of my local friends here who pastors a church here in Atlanta and, you know, major church, major budget, trying to balance it. And he's already talking about making cuts in terms of his staff up to 30%. And uh, what is your take on that? Because uh, I know I know companies yeah. are doing it everywhere. Billion, billion dollar companies are doing it. Would you advise, <laughs> but last night said, well, you know, there are some people who need to go anywhere. I've been trying to figure out how to, how, 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 how do they go? And it's almost like the coronavirus did it because otherwise I wouldn't have done it. What is your take on that in terms of, of how do we, is it a good time to make cuts? Is it a good time to reevaluate the budgets? What is your estimation on that? Well, you know, for pastors that are afraid to fire people, you, you need to hire somebody that can run your church because if you need a coronavirus to fire somebody that should have been fired, you got a bigger problem than the next two or three months is going to solve. That's number one. You got to be willing and able to fire people. I fired my cousin. I fired my mother in my first church. My mother was the organist. My father died. She was a church musician. She came to church every week late. She couldn't, I said, you can be my mom. You can't be my organist. You've got to be willing to fire people. You can't wait till a crisis and blame on the crisis. You've got to have the courage to fire people. Now, let me say this. Um, there is in the stimulus package, this $2.2 trillion package that the president signed, there is a piece of this legislation called the payroll protection section, which means that the Small Business Administration, through your bank, will give you enough money, give, it starts out as a loan, but ultimately they will give you enough money to cover your whole payroll for two and a half months. So if you take one month expense, multiplied times 250%, you go to the bank and the bank will not only give you a loan sufficient to cover your payroll, but also to cover certain expenses like rent and mortgage and other expenses that qualify under that program. We'll be talking in detail about this on the webinar Wednesday. So I would say, no, don't, don't lay anybody off right now because you need all the help you can get. Right now, this broadcast, you couldn't do this by yourself, Pastor. You need people doing the cameras. You need people doing the technology. We, we, need, we need our staff now more than we ever needed before. In fact, I'm writing new job descriptions. I'm giving out new assignments because Having an operation like ours without having an office, without having physical meetings, without having a sanctuary, this is, this is a new normal. And we spent the last two or three weeks just kind of keeping up and catching up. But we now know 
that we're going to be home for at least the next uh, for at least the next month. So it's not a surprise. So we've got to do we've got to be proactive, and the only way to be proactive is to have help. I've got young people that that are specialists in Instagram and in Twitter. You know, we put up Cash App. I didn't even think people would give on Cash App. We, we have a growing number of people donating money to the church through Cash App. And, you know, I had I had one cat that was trying to set it up, he, and he couldn't set it up. We've got young people. In fact, on, on Wednesday, give you another preview, one of the opportunities that we have for ministry now is that we can get more young people involved in ministry than we ever have before. You're not going to ask so an 85-year-old saint to update a website. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so in all these platforms and, and, you know, WhatsApp and group chat and video chat, this is a perfect time to get our grandchildren and their friends involved in ministry who don't even go to church. So true. That is that is absolutely, you know, and and when you think about the last five or 10 years, there's been so much talk about millennials and how they felt disconnected from the church. And it's almost as if. You know, this is an opportunity for evangelism and reach out and, and, and to connect with that group. You know, um, you said $23 million was the project that you had in terms of the church. That's How right. long did it take you to get that control? Because you did pay that, get the mortgage paid off? No, it's down to eight. It took me, it took about five wow. years, uh, let's see, 2005. It, it took us about five years to get it down to about 11 million, another couple of years to get it down to nine. We've got 8 million left. And, you know, the rule of thumb is this. Um, I want my first Sunday offering to cover my debt service. And until my first Sunday offering covers my debt service, I'm feeling a little stressed that I don't want to feel. Uh, now, I want, I want the whole thing paid off and we were we were tracking towards that, but we also built a senior citizen apartment building. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, we built an 80,000 square foot health clinic. In the meantime, we built, uh, we're building another senior housing. We built, an, we, we, we built, we took over a drug dealer run housing complex and ran the drug dealers out and built 124 houses for low and moderate income people. So, so we've been leveraging money and moving money around quite a bit. Uh, we weren't only focused on the church because we, see, we, we didn't have land like you have. We were in the middle of the hood, surrounded by public housing. And so before we could build our new sanctuary, we had to rebuild the neighborhood because you couldn't fit a brand new, beautiful 80,000 square foot sanctuary in the middle of the poorest neighborhood in central New Jersey. So we had to invest money and time and talent and staff in rebuilding the whole neighborhood. So if you grew up in that neighborhood and came back today and drove around, you wouldn't recognize it because the projects behind the church are gone. <clears throat> brand new housing, new supermarket, two new parks, new apartment buildings, new condominiums, with no gentrification and no displacement. My God, that's 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 beyond phenomenal, and uh, and I think it's a great model because we talk. One of the things I've heard you talk about before, and uh, not just in, not just in the importance of uh, providing ministry, but it's almost as if churches need some additional income generators. Uh, so when you can provide ministry and also generate some revenue outside of tithes and offerings. Do you have any other strategies for how you can recommend pastors and churches uh, find another stream of income? Sure. I mean, real estate is always an option, and many churches have um, acres of land that are undeveloped. Many churches have access to inner city properties that have been abandoned, and uh, there are two ways to do it. One is you take church finances, and you invest those church finances in real estate and then convert that real estate into a use that generates income. That's what we did in the case of the health clinic. We bought an abandoned newspaper warehouse. We renovated that warehouse and then we leased it to a Catholic hospital to run our health clinic. And so the rent and the revenue from the 
healthcare service cover the debt service on the building. So that's one way to do it. The other way is through joint ventures. We did a joint venture with a young black real estate developer. We had the land, he had the money, and we split the proceeds on the back end. So there are a number of ways to do it. But as I was saying before we started uh, on camera, sometimes, Pastor Smith, the way you survive is by expanding. And I, I learned mm. this from white people, that, that when, when we are stressed, when we are in a crunch, when, when, when our options seem limited, we have a tendency to hold on and pray. What white people do is look up and invest. And so it could be that many of our churches that are stressed and strapped, instead of shrinking and laying people off, will look at their resources and expand. We started uh, out of our D3 ministry, we started a small investment group among our church members, those who could afford it. And they put in money, we took the money to buy abandoned uh, houses, you know, during the foreclosure crisis, we had all these houses. So we bought the house, fixed the house up, sold the house to low income people, and then gave our members a 15% return on the investment. Mm. So this is, the, this is the kind of creativity that I think we need. And if you talk about millennials coming to church, millennials will flock to churches where it's not only great worship and great fellowship, but concrete contributions to the quality of life in our neighborhoods. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. And what I like about it, you said you did it with the inner, in the inner city without gentrification, but through diligent hard work partnerships. And um, now were these, were these relationships that you left, did you pull a team together around you? Because I think sometimes we know you, you, it's obvious you were very resourceful and not just a genius in your own right, but just with the civic connection that you've made. What about the pastor who does not have those relationships or who can leverage, you know, the corporate structure as well as governmental agencies? What do you advise that pastor who doesn't have those types of connections? In, in most instances, Pastor Smith, even in smaller churches, I was talking to an AME bishop in Texas, and she said to me, she said, don't forget about the little churches with 25 and 50 members. In those small churches, there are people sitting in the pews that no healthcare, that no law, that no government. You'd be surprised to know what church members possess and who they're related to. So you may have an usher, you know, working in, in a church with 100 members whose cousin's on a city council. So you've got to, you've got to mine out the potential that comes from relationships because you know, we, we, most of us are six degrees uh, separate from somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. It, it's amazing to me, e even in large churches like ours, uh, we often miss who's in our congregation. So we, we did a video, I laugh about this, but it's not really that funny. We did a video about, uh, you know, COVID-19 uh, and, and uh, the woman who did the video is in our nurses ministry. Now, you know, based on your background, that to be in a nurse's ministry, you needed a white dress, a white hat, a blue cape, and some orange juice. And that's what the nurses did. The nurses wore white dress, white hat, blue cape, and brought the preacher orange juice and mints. But this woman in our nurse's ministry is an MD and a PhD. Wow. But a lot of people, when they saw her in the nurse's ministry, they just assumed she was just one of these women that wear the white dress, a blue cape, <laughs> a white hat, and brings on juice and mints. But she's an MD and a PhD on the nurses ministry. I found out one of my ushers was the CEO of the top physical rehabilitation center on the East Coast. And she's ushering. Wow. Wow. So when when wow. when when big shots have car accidents and go to the hospital and be released for for rehab, they go to her facility. So these, wow. these are the resources. You have to start with what you have, the members of our churches and their cousins and their fraternity brothers and their sorority sisters. These people will be happy to help any church that they see is willing to do more than shout on Sunday. And then the bank, we take money to the bank. No matter how much it is, we take money to the bank every Monday. Every bank has someone inside the bank that's willing to sit down with our churches to show them how to access SBA money, 
to show them how to do real estate financing. They'll come to the church and do workshops for first time home buyers. But we have to assume that we have something of value that other people want to partner with. You know, do right. uh, we, we, we have to learn our value. We have to learn that politicians come by our churches because they need us. It's not a privilege to have a politician come to our church. They need the church more than we need them to come campaign at the church. So we've got to stop letting the governmental and commercial interests of this nation pimp the church and represent the value proposition that we bring. Not only do we have assets, but we got the Holy Ghost and we've got scripture and we've got salvation. That's so good. Somebody asked a question online. Ask a couple of them, okay. pose them as we close out and uh, try to encourage everybody to go make sure they sign for the workshop on Wednesday. They ask about an emergency fund. Do you think that the church should have churches should have an emergency fund, emergency funds for times such as this? And if so, how much do you recommend? Yes, sir. Our church every year we budget to spend 90 percent of our income and we put 10 percent in our reserve. Right now, our church could operate. Uh, for months without having any offer. I hope none of my members are watching that. But that's how we budget. Every year, every year, Dr. Smith, since we changed our culture, since 2005, all through the, through, through the financial crisis, our church, if we bring in a million dollars, we're going to have 100000 left in the bank every year. Now, how do we do it? I'll show you how we do it. First of all, every year, despite the fact that we've only had about five Sundays in 30 years that nobody's joined. Every year, our budget for the next year assumes no growth. So if we brought in, we brought in X number of dollars in 2019, we budget to bring in the exact same amount of money in 2020, even though we know it's gonna be higher. But we don't, we don't plan on spending the increase. Then on the expense side, we budget to increase our expenses. Like right now, I've got two staff positions in my budget that I probably won't fill. So now you budget low on the income side, you budget high on the expense side, and then you still only budget to spend 90% of what comes in. And I promise you, you will have an emergency fund and a surplus and investment options every single year. That's awesome. You've been doing you've been doing it since two thousand five. Yes, sir. And every year, <clears throat> every year, my my uh, my trustees will tell you every year we bring in at least ten percent net That's revenue. Awesome. Every year. That's Doesn't awesome. Doesn't matter what we do. Doesn't matter what the economy so, does. Wow. And that's why you can sit back and you know, we're about endangering people from church services and doing because you've been preparing, you've been preparing along the way. I learned that from Joseph. Joseph said, "Look, in the years of it's going to be good for seven years. In yes, doing sir. those seven years, don't eat everything you have, don't spend everything you make, put it aside." And what's interesting is that Pharaoh, who wasn't even a child of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, Pharaoh listened to Joseph. And what I find today, I just had a United States senator on the phone this afternoon. I find that the Pharaohs of the land today are sometimes more attracted to my message than than the children of abraham isaac and jacob pastors oh um, uh, pastors run from this message and politicians run to it that's great listen that's you've been absolutely incredible as always i'm excited about what you, you're sharing with us and things you introduce sharing your wisdom and i know you're going to get more uh, in more more detail, even on Wednesday, can you share with the people again what's going on, on Wednesday, so they can be aware of it? And uh, once yeah. you share it, and I want you to give us some closing remarks and and close us out with a word of prayer, if you don't mind, sir. Yes, sir. On Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, I'm having a webinar, and it's called uh, "Managing Church Finances during the COVID-19 crisis. There it is right there, managing church finances during the COVID-19 crisis. I'm gonna talk about the strategies for addressing 
church income. I'm going to talk about our strategy for managing church expenses. So I'm going to talk as a pastor to pastors, deacons, elders, and just concerned members of how to protect your church from falling apart financially during this crisis when we can't gather on Sunday morning. Then I've got a lawyer coming on, and the lawyer is going to give an analysis of this uh, stimulus package and explain to churches and church leaders what the law requires that banks and other agencies do to help us. Then I've got a banker coming on. I've got a guy who has loaned churches over a billion dollars, and he's going to teach churches how to deal with their banks and offer the help if they don't know how to do it. Then I've got a special guest, uh, Senator Tim Scott is coming on. He is the African-American Senator from South Carolina. He helped write the legislation. He's gonna come on to explain the background and to urge people to take advantage of this government money. Don't be afraid of it. It's user-friendly and it's real. It's not a joke, it's not a hoax, it's not a Trump trick. This is a legitimate opportunity for churches for the first time in history to have access to the same resources that big corporate American companies have. So that's Wednesday at one o'clock. It's gonna last for 90 minutes. Uh, you go to the website right there, mydfree.org, register. It's free. I'm not selling anything. It's free. And we'll talk about the defree course and other resources that that are that are in our hands to help. Listen, the Bible says if we have much, we have to do much. To whom much is given, much is required. I don't need any money. Thank God. Personally, I don't need any money. God has blessed me. I'm on three corporate boards. I make more money. Do it. I make more money to go to a board meeting at one of my companies than most guys make preaching a, a week long revival. <laughs> I'm on the board of three companies. Two of them are public companies. They pay me. I'm the chairman of the compensation committee for all three companies. I establish compensation for men that make four and five million dollars a year. So I'm doing fine. Hmm. So I don't have to do this. I don't make any money off D free. I'm not on salary from D free. I got a staff run by a brilliant lawyer who went to Spelman College. She runs D free. This this is this is my commitment to God. If I never preach another revival, if I never give another speech, I am fine. So this is not about me. I'm not auditioning to be anything. I'm not campaigning to be somebody. I'm very happy being who I am, and I'm very proud of what I've done. But I do believe that I could have even done more than I've done if some of the older guys, when I was coming along, had helped me. And I'm committed to you, Dr. Smith. I talked to a young preacher in South Carolina yesterday, and I told him I'm coming to help him. I, I love the fact that God has spared my life. I had cancer 10 years ago, and I could have died, mm. and God healed me of cancer. My father died at 47 years old. He was much more worthy to live a long life than I am. I owe it to God to be useful in the kingdom to help young guys like you and young women like uh, Gina Stewart in Memphis and 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 uh, everybody. So I, I'm I'm here to work for the kingdom, and I believe God has already blessed me. I'm not doing it to be blessed. I've been blessed already. Been blessed already, and I appreciate your respect. But uh, don't respect me for what I've done. Respect me for what I am doing. And I, I believe I'm doing exactly what God put me here to do. I appreciate your friendship. Your, I appreciate your opening the doors of your ministry to our work. I appreciate Sabrina. You got a jewel in Sabrina. She's a, she's a mm -hmm. worker. And Absolutely. Um, I appreciate my, I've got a team of young people. I want you to meet them. Uh, you were kind to my brother when he when he came there, but I've got a team of young people. The average age of my staff was around 29. You know, I've got almost all young people working for me, and I I just pray that God will keep using you, and keep giving me opportunities like these to help men like you, who are balanced, who are educated, who are spirit filled, who believe in life after death, but justice on this earth. So thank you. So you want to pray Thanks now? Thank you so much. All I right. want you to pray now. Yes, sir. Let's pray. Okay. God, I thank you for this young man 
for this ministry. I thank you for this great church. And I thank you, God, in spite of this season of challenge and turbulence, I thank you for opportunities and doors that are open to do ministry. Pray now. what's right, <clears throat> but to represent our people with dignity, class, and style. Surround her with the kind of leaders that she needs to represent us all over this country. Bless Dr. E. Dewey Smith and his family. Protect them from hurt, harm, and danger, and sickness. And we pray, God, that when we come through this valley and shadow of death, that we will come through without having been stopped by fear knowing that you are on our side. We thank and praise you, God, not because of, but in spite of. And we pray that we will, in fact, never get weary, that we'll wait on you, and that we will mount up and have wings like eagles, that we'll continue to run and not get weary, walk and not faint. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Man of God, thank you who you are. I'm so excited about Wednesday. I'm going to encourage everybody Thank who's you. really interested in trying to take the next level, join us Wednesday for D-Free, that one-day session with the webinar, 90 Minutes. It's going to be filled with a lot of great, great content. I'm just honored Dr. Soares will come on, so make sure you tell your people now, pastors, leaders, men of us who are already quarantined and locked in, uh, stay at home, automatic stay at homes, uh, governor, make sure that you take advantage of this. It's on TV anyway, get something that's going to help your church and help us to move forward and leave something to the next generation. I thank you so much for your time, Dr. Soares and all who tuned in. You. If you were blessed, if you got something, let me know where you tuned in from. Also, if you like, uh, please like it. If, you, if you're blessed by it, subscribe to all of our social media mediums, and then make sure you forward this to somebody else. We're logging off now. I'll see you Wednesday. We got some more content uh, coming tonight uh, for those singles who are over 40. Uh, you want to log on, you can at 8.30, a little, little less than an hour. Uh, but make sure you share this with somebody else. And always remember this. If you'll be good to God, God will be good to you. I love you. Take care. Peace. We'll see you next time. Thank you. God bless you, man.